hi, welcome everybody to this panel. Um, well, this roundtable um, on remaking Indian cities through peripheral resettlement. Uh, this roundtable represents the second step in our journey of putting together a volume on resettlement in India. The first step was a small shop that we held in September online for, you know, to convene a set of papers that we would like to have, hold in the panel. And this step aims to present the efforts to a larger audience and get some feedback in the form of actually very short interventions by a sa selected sample of authors. Uh, so the idea for the volume comes from a recognition that uh, uh, urban peripheral resettlement is emerging as a powerful nationwide template uh, being increasingly adopted to sort of build, achieve this world-class city. Striking commonalities in these projects across India's cities start with uh, the built space of uniform... Trying to get the next slide on. Uh, of uniform multi-story tenements huddled together, representing mass accommodation at ever more ambitious scales of 25 to 30,000 families in a single site, typically of the most marginal urban populations, EWS, low caste, informal workers, religious minorities, seasonal migrants. So we're arguing that mass peripheral urban resettlement has emerged since the 2000s as a dominant mode of urban restructuring in India, embodying two convergent imperatives. First, the urgent upscaling of uh, low-income housing stock to meet vast shortages. And secondly, the rehousing of slum dwellers, routinely now evicted from cities for infrastructure or, or ecological restoration projects, increasingly for climate adaptation projects, etc. So resettlement has become a dominant uh, a development project in its own right, fulfilling multiple urban governance objectives, including alleviating poverty, formalizing informal settlements, integrating informal workers into formal markets and disciplining them through taxes, uh, service fee <coughs> obligations, responsibilities for maintaining their neighborhoods through residence associations. Now, not new. Um, moving slum dwellers out of cities for sanitation, uh, sanitizing and renewing cities has been on since the city improvement trusts of the late 19th century. But until the 19, late 1990s, these efforts were scattered and small scale, with the exception of the emergency in Delhi in the 1970s, which was a violent banishment of a very different character, we argue, than the sort of formal rehousing that contemporary resettlement programs represent. What is distinctive from the contemporary phenomenon is a combination of scale and policy intent. Urban resettlement in India today comprises large-scale, systematic, well-funded rehousing of the urban poor in planned, fully-serviced sites to formalize and integrate them into mainstream urban renewal agendas. So this policy framework of inclusion, we say, is a defining feature of this phenomenon. Resettlement programs provide tenure security through various means, and despite conditional nature of these, the rights that they confer, these agreements endow their holders with a sense of having and holding property, as you know, Barn and others argue in their uh, study. Formalization affords residents a set of protections and promises, including legal entitlement to state-provided services and a new relationship with the state. Now, resettlement colonies differ in some respects. First, while the vast majority comprise ready-built tenement housing, a few provide service plots. Second, while the majority are built and managed by states, there is an increasing trend of private developers using incentives from programs like PMA to construct housing colonies on cheap peripheral lands for sale to low-income households. This privatization of resettlement is also evident in Mumbai under the slum re resettlement scheme. So despite the intents and promises of formalization, resettlement has rarely, if ever, launched a pathway of advancement for its subjects. Instead, it has produced new complexes of disadvantage that have inhibited the physical and social mobility, socioeconomic mobility of their, uh, of their resettlement populations, blocked their integration into the urban mainstream, and created islands of exception or ghettos. Studies across Indian cities <coughs> highlight three interlinked dynamics, namely peripheralization, discrimination, and disconnection that converge to constitute resettlement as a specific mode of marginalization. 
So um, geographic paraphilization is a paradigmatic feature of contemporary resettlement. The scholarship on peripheral urbanization in India, focused on speculative investments in luxury townships or industrial estates, has yet to contend fully with the mostly hidden presence of these large formal low-income housing projects in metropolitan peripheries across India. But peripheration here is less a matter of physical distance from the city than about a relegation to lands of the lowest market value. The peripheralization of low-income housing is rooted in particular geographies of value in the metropolitan for formation. The projects are sited on poor quality or hazardous lands prone to flooding or abutting toxic facilities such as garbage, garbage dump yards or heavy industries. Second, resettlement colonies across Indian cities, whether tenement style or plot based, state built or private, manifest a consistently inferior and discriminatory standard of infrastructure and services, reproducing slum like conditions. Third, they produce multiple forms of disconnection from spatial di dislocation to disruption in livelihood networks and relationships caused by their disconnection from the city. Taken together then, we are looking at a distinctive social spatial phenomenon unfolding across the country, which is redefining the social geographies of urban marginality. We conceptualize this as a form of differential inclusion, which incorporates subaltern populations into a tiered and unequal order. In this sense, resettlement, um, in this sense, resettlement affects a settlement between the state's dual imperatives of reclaiming urban land for projects of accumulation and accommodating excluded populations that press their claims through political means. So the volume then goes on to examine how the urban is being remade at the margins by resettled residents in different ways over time. Temporality plays a key role in shifting the lived experience of resettlement and transforming these sites over time, typically a decade or so or more. Following the early fiction, residents shift their energies to rebuilding. In plot-based resettlement, remaking is often from scratch, it's like auto construction from scratch in a formal space that is shot through with irregularities of titling, regulation, and governance. In tenement-based resettlement, rebuilding comprises struggles to address um, inadequate services and secure entitlements. In both cases, rebuilding complicates the proce process of formalization as resettled populations turn to informal self-provisioning or agitating for their rights as they did in slums. So I just have a closing paragraph. So stories of transformation in these colonies are told in different ways, shaped by gender, generation, duration of residence, the influence of intermediaries, um, and larger contexts of city and project governance. But all these accounts veer between tales of amelioration and deterioration. Seen through an extended time frame of remaking urban space and lives at the margins, resettlement emerges as an anomalous double-edged process. Scholars have captured its effect through terms like marginalized formalization that index both the recognition and rights implied by the resetting of relationships with the state and the everyday discrimination that those new relationships entail. But it is only through the experience of residents that the diverse meanings and outcomes of resettlement for differentially placed households can be understood. So our volume will seek to include a diversity of voices, not only from the outside, scholars, etc., but from the inside. So I open it up to the rest of our uh, round table now. Uh, the next person coming on will be Kaveri Haritas. Um, Yes. So, so is on. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Am I clear? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, I think we have each of us has about six minutes to uh, make a presentation. So I'll be really uh, quick. Uh, my work has been in Lagere in the southwest of Bangalore. It's one of the largest rehabilitation areas. And uh, I published a book based on my doctoral research last year. Uh, and uh, my interest is specifically in the in the legal uh, arrangements uh, that that take place within these areas. Uh, many scholars have re referred to these spaces as conforming to different legal patterns. You know, they're not necessarily the same kind of legal rights or property rights that uh, people enjoy in other parts of the city. Uh, Veena Das, for instance, has uh, spoken of it as a space of exception. 
but what I discovered in these rehabilitation areas is that uh, uh, even within these areas, there are different policy laws in place, depending on the kind of allotments uh, that are provided un under the various schemes uh, that they are allotted these lands. In some cases, these are plots, so there is a higher possibility for them to uh, completely legalize these settlements over a period of time and therefore become absorbed within the city. Uh, whereas this is not necessarily uh, possible by by residents living in these uh, apartment buildings. So I have actually focused primarily on the property rights of those who are provided apartment housing. And there we see that uh, even if there is a possibility for them to claim full property rights and therefore ownership of these apartments, the manner in which uh, this is constructed, as Karen uh, you know spoke of, these are very, very badly constructed buildings. Uh, they, it, it results in a, in a refusal of many of these slum residents to actually take on ownership. So they, they sort of prefer to remain in a, in a relationship of dependence with the state. Uh, so many of them sort of realign their original design, uh, you know, desires to become property owners in the city to become temporal habitants in these areas, uh, with the, with the, uh, with an acceptance that they would be a permanence of negotiations and renegotiations uh, to constantly reclaim their housing, especially when these buildings are demolished. Uh, for instance, in the 1980s, the buildings that were built were demolished um, in uh, between 2011 and 13. And uh, at that time, again, residents had to again renegotiate with the state to ensure that they had allotments. So what does this actually do to property rights of, uh, of citizens? And here, I think uh, you know, there's a good amount of studies that have already been conducted. But I've also been looking at, at some of the instances of uh, what you would call incrementalization, you know, incrementality that we constantly refer to when we are talking about the urban poor, which does not stop in the, in the slum, but continues in the slum rehabilitation area. So this incrementally obtaining rights to the house continues and, and becomes sort of a, a permanence. So there is a permanence of temporality that we see within rehabilitation areas. But if we zoom out and if we look at the strategies of the state and try to understand how the state is approaching property rights, we begin to realize that this is not restricted only to the poor, that the manner in which uh, this sort of flexible and temporal dealings uh, around land and uh, what you what I might call a sort of a checkered geography of property rights exists uh, in which there are different classes or different segments of the population are dealt with in a very different way. Here I'd, I'd like to make a small reference to a paper that I wrote earlier last year in early 2022 uh, with the Center for Social and Economic Progress where I was looking also at regularization laws in the manner in which, again, once again, that the whole notion of incrementally uh, you know, gaining rights to property is reflected in these laws as well. So, so how does one understand, uh, you know, how the state uh, approaches property rights? I think we need to, add, uh, on the one hand, look at what is happening with the urban poor, but also put it in context with how the state is dealing with land and property in itself uh, on the larger scale, on the uh, broader dimensions. Coming back to to rehabilitation housing, so uh, the the manner in in which illegality sort of persists in these new spaces of housing is rather interesting because um, the whole notion of formalization, the whole promise of formalization, is that the urban poor become uh, full citizens that they sort of lose their second second uh, rung citizenship or uh, um, you know to to become absorbed within the city where at least that these are their desires that they actually want to become absorbed as citizens they want to become full citizens and one most important manner in which uh, this this can take place is through the right to one's own land or to one's own house and when that does not happen, you see people realign their desires and they become sort of, uh, you know, more transactional 
And here, uh, I would like to sort of step away a little bit from the victimization mode to also sort of see uh, how do they take advantage of, of whatever little resources they are provided. Um, this is something I've looked at in my book, but I'd like to look at a little bit more and how do they respond to these constant continual negotiations of property rights um, and realign their desires for homemaking within the city. So with this, I'll, I'll uh, come to an end. I think my time is up. Thank you. What perfect timing and thanks for that. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't um, introduce Kaveri properly. She's an assistant professor at the Jindal School of Government and po uh, pu Public Policy, Opal, OP Jindal Global University at Sonipat. And the next paper will be uh, of, uh, Marina Joseph, who is from Yuba in Mumbai. Um, Marina? Yeah, uh, can you see the screen? Hi, can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? We can see your screen. Good yes, time. yes, Marina. Okay, okay. thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person very quickly because we just have six minutes. Uh, the focus of my paper is on resettlement housing in Mumbai. Uh, high density resettlement or RNR housing has now existed in the city for two and, more than two and a half decades. It has also proliferated during this time with more than 60 such colonies built across the city. Uh, earlier development plans had land use reservation categories for housing for the urban poor, such as public housing and housing for the dishouse. And this was even reduced to RNR as a land use category, indicating the future type of housing for the urban poor in the city. This model that actually started in, this, in Bombay uh, has been doubted for its financial success, replicated all across the country in various states. And while one acknowledges the provision of formal housing, and there is even extensive scholarship on the impacts of this model, who benefits, who doesn't, uh, even with its challenges, there is a complete normalization and almost a reliance on this method of housing provision as the only means to create uh, formal housing for the poor. Broadly, the goals of this paper, and I won't get into the details during this presentation, uh, I'm just drawing from Yuva's experience, my own experience of engaging in these colonies for more than a decade, and the need to nuance uh, accountability of multiple institutions and actors in the provision of resettlement uh, housing through select cases of actually having tried to improve conditions and access to services, highlight what the lack of accountability does for housing governance, and ultimately make a case for the need to develop resettlement housing governance policy. Uh, I refer to this concept of the submerged state that explains the provision of resettlement housing, where the provision of public services is carried out by private, for-profit, not-for-profit organizations with the aim to save public resources and also make processes supposedly more efficient. However, what it does is it creates a highly fragmented institutional landscape in planning, implementation and management of this form of resettlement housing. Uh, there is a lot of focus in this model on the creation of a housing stock, the process of resettlement of the poor, the actual uh, provision of housing, but actually lesser focus on the creation of these colonies as places of adequate habitat. The operation of, and maintenance of these colonies is rife with coordination issues, confusion of roles and responsibilities, and accountability gaps between all these multiple actors. Of course, there is also a changed nature of public accountability when public services like housing and its associated basic services are transferred to various organizations. Uh, this, of course, leads to what has previously been referred to as islands of exception, where services are a mix of what may or may not have been provided in slums where the residents once lived. But who can really be held accountable for the, uh, when the delivery of housing, and by housing I don't just mean the tenement or the building, but the complete world that is created, when housing itself is provided by multiple and often conflicting actors. Just, as, uh, just to sort of uh, uh, show the different actors that are involved in the provision of R&R housing in the city, uh, 
This diagram shows a web of multiple institutions and actors involved at various levels with unclear roles and responsibilities very often. This poses a huge challenge to accountability and governance. Just as an example, take for example, private developers who build, in, build, these, house, build these houses in New York TDR. Once the bare structure has been constructed, there have been examples of them having managed to write off contractual agreements of providing stormwater drainage, street lights and amenities. Or take for example, who can be held accountable for the large number of school dropouts owing to the poor provision of education facilities in, in RNR housing? Is it the SRA and the MMRDA who act as planning authorities for these colonies? Or the municipal corporation who is elected and the service providing authority but actually has no ownership over these colonies? There have, it is only in the last couple of years that land transfers have even happened in these colonies. It's taken nearly two decades for land transfers to happen and as a result of which the land, uh, so services are not provided adequately. Of course, this takes me back to the question of uh, the need to highlight, why highlight accountability? And two reasons for that. One is it's rooted in collaboration and democratic governance. And second, the question of housing justice form of formal state provided housing. Here I use Bell and Nehu's accountability framework to highlight that it's not just the state, but multiple actors in the process of resettlement housing who are answerable to the public and most importantly, each other along the spectrum. Accountability that is embedded in vertical, horizontal and partnership governance arrangements that reflect hierarchical, collaborative and network modes of governance respectively can be one way to ensure that resettlement housing as it exists today is a just form of housing. Um, if accountability is what can solve these challenges and improve resettlement housing in the way we know it, uh, we need policy to guide this and currently there is a policy vacuum. Of course, a legislative framework for maintenance exists via the State Cooperative Housing Societies Act. However, this does not speak to the reality of the conditions of these residents. A resettlement housing policy must be reflective of people's realities in these colonies and while we accept that they do make these colonies livable, can the complete onus of making beyond them uh, to make these adequate, make these colonies places of adequate livable habitats when actually rampant poverty also exists among these residents. Of course, policy also needs to bring to focus accountable governance practices to ensure the long-term creation of adequate habitats in these RNR colonies moving beyond tenements and single buildings. And importantly, yeah, I'm almost done, the last point. Importantly, the last two and a half decades have shown that policy must have a regulatory framework and ensure various institutions have clear accountability relationships to ensure housing justice at its core. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marina. That's great. Um, sorry, let me get to my next. So the next uh, presentation will be by Lalita Kramat and Smita Vaigankar. I think Smita will be speaking online. Uh, both of them are from the School of Policy and Governance in um, uh, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. Um, so Smita will be presenting. Hello to all, I'm Smita. Uh, so I'm presenting the Basically, the contesting idea of marginality experiences in Lunglai and Aizol in Mizoram. This is based on our qualitative research work in Aizol and Lunglai done by Professor uh, Dr. Lalita Kamath and me. So, to begin with, we have very few pointers about the context. So, prior to Janunaram, uh, before introduction of BSUP and IHSDP, the housing schemes for urban poor, housing is basically, and the other basic services, has been provided by the Wang. Wang is an indigenous local governing system. But the Janunaram brought two major changes. One is they bring a targeted approach. So, they identified and uh, designated as a slum for a rehousing poor. Earlier, there is no slum of officially existed. However, the when, uh, however, the poor people resides in the bank. 
so there is no separate area for them and the second is the state government become the provider of the housing for a poor and housing become the subject of a political contestation between the state and society so this emerges two different trajectories uh the basically resettlement colonies in aizol they adopted the multi story building construction of the multi story building on the peripheries state decides the criteria of eligibility even the landless even those are resides in the uh, rental houses they got uh, they got the access to the this uh, form of resettlement colonies uh, but in nunglai uh, the idea of the multi story housing they outright rejected and they go for a in situ housing so dudo together with the bank governance played very key important role to selection of the identify the criteria for the beneficiaries so those who possess the land own the house or who could buy the land become the beneficiary under this scheme the next slide sorry is moving okay yeah uh you can see from this pictures so one is the picture of a resettlement colony under the built in the under the bsp in aizol so you can see the condition of this resettlement colony so poor quality of a construction and also poorly managed and maintenance of the resettlement colony vis a vis other picture is the house built under the ihsdp it's a inside picture is a semi pakka assam type but it's much much better so can we say that this is the basically where we can see the marginalization and inclusion so we termed as a limited inclusion so this is the duality in a mission uh in aizol when we interview few people resides in the resettlement colony one stated that it's better than what we had earlier this tell us the resettlement housing did reach some landless poor families but this was a limited inclusion because the concentrated and segregated them from the social life services and security of the bank producing a new form of a slum and the stigma where those colonies are called as a bsup colonies and the second one is hinged on the value for a 10 years so it is a condition that you first get the uh, permission to reside that house for a 10 years and its continuation is subject to subject to the approval at the two level so one at the state level and another is a bank level and also this seems to be dominated the new cooperative housing society formed to run the housing what is in case of ihsdp in lunglai so they adapt the in situ housing so families possessing the land or having the relatives who could donate the land them they get benefited from this scheme while it was more flexible than the multi story housing by the state it targeted a limited number of people and didn't reach the poorest who without the land so here the inclusion was again severely very limited outcome so yes outcomes seem different but there are important commonalities as well so one one is about the changing the meaning standards and norms of a housing in urban mizoram breaking the vain system which is a very strong local indigenous governing system this food for a socializing housing this for a poor groups to some extent increasingly advancing the private property vested in the individual property rights creating new categories like beneficiaries shift from universal to targeted approaches which involves greater stigma of a slum sticky label the next and last slide so how do we understand differentiated outcome in both so yes we saw the some uh, sort of a inclusion as well as a marginalization in both the approaches so the idea of practice of a mission driven settlement in driven by the interplay of a politics of a indigeneity with the neoliberal ideas of a reforms at a two level one is about the bottom up locally based everyday governance and the next is a top down approach uh, rooted in the urban state department so introduction of a urban state department it's also uh, through the genunarem mission so i we can conclude by saying this two important i think observation or the statement that one is 
mission approach influenced overall housing outcome in the cities state government played a very key role as to how to adapt negotiate or reject the central government housing approach uh, and the second the changes in functionality of a udnpa urban development department and poverty alleviation department because there is a we see the shift towards a more modern bureaucratic and distant form of governance uh, It's a very important that January brought the eyes on municipal corporation. That is the first time municipality institution introduced here, and that changes uh, many things in the way governance. So, uh, at the last we can say, at the last we can say that all these things still is uh, concentrated or in hand of a state level government. That is UD and PA are uh, uh, handling and managing all these things. so yeah i am stop here uh, lalita is uh, if you want you can add i think the time presentation thank, thank you. you thank you very much smita and you ended perfectly on time too was all thank you real challenge to do this in 7 minutes or so um and next we have kinjal and nidhi and uh, here hold on let me just I just want to introduce Kinjal. Uh, they are both from the Indian Institute of Human Settlements. Um, yeah. Karen, lights, please. Simpreet, can you um, present next while we wait for them to load this? Uh, is Simpreet up there? Okay. Um, Simpreet is a PhD student at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, and yeah, we'll ask him to present next. Simpreet, are you here? Let me see if he's on. He's not. Okay. Um, can you message him, Naresh? So, N Naresh is uh, um, studying at the National Law School of India University, and uh, yeah. Good morning to all. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm Naresh. I'm currently pursuing a master's degree in public policy at the National Law School of University in Bangalore. So, um, my contribution to this volume, uh, I aim to examine how the process of uh, involuntary peripheral resettlement impacts political engagement, <coughs> and uh, I I aim to uh, relate to the framing that Karen spoke of in the remaking of lives part uh, and. Uh, a crucial aspect of the post free settlement remaking uh, of lives is the formation of new political uh, collectivities and constituencies 
So uh, several studies have established how residents living in informal settlements uh, leverage political networks uh, to access public services. This is true of Chennai as well. Um, to give a short brief history, uh, beginning in the early 1970s, the Tamil Nadu Slum Clearance Board initially deployed a paternalistic approach towards the urban poor through in-situ construction of tenements within the city. Uh, this also built up their poor water base of the low-income urban poor of the Dravida Munnetra Karagam, the current ruling party. This approach uh, eventually evolved first to a sites and services approach and then uh, gradually under the influence of a world-class um, city Uh, world-class city rational, it evolved to a uh, to to the current mode of housing production, which is mass resettlement to the urban periphery. So, uh, while the nature and extent of political engagement between parties and the urban poor underwent several transformation, as I just explained, amidst this shifting uh, approaches, the clientelistic uh, relations between the urban poor and the political parties remain constant. Uh, there are several accounts of how uh, residents of informal settlements leverage these connections to place demands on the state and also to facilitate uh, access to essential services. While the, uh, what is missing in this lit literature are accounts of how these dynamics change due to resettlement. Um, with the goal of inclusion through formalization, state-directed peripheral resettlement has emerged as a dominant response to affordable housing question. The site for my study is Perumbakam, which is located nearly 30 kilometers away from the heart of Chennai. I aim to examine the dynamics of interaction between the political parties and over 24,000 low-income households which are packed into eight-story tenements in this site. Some of the questions that I aim to answer are how does the pop, uh, process of formalization um, affect the gap between the political party and the uh, households that are situated in the resettlement colonies? And uh, how do political parties, specifically the current party in power, whose core water base consists of uh, working class po population, look at this concentration of thousands of household households? Does it present an opportunity to these parties? Is the question that I'm trying to answer. Um, another key factor is the uh, that of administrative boundaries. What is the impact of being outside the limit of the Chennai corporation and within the limit of a village panjayat, despite being in the border of the city? Um, by answering this question, I hope to identify the unique political trajectories of resettlement and the post-resettlement rebuilding of life. So a little bit about the site. Uh, the site consists of 158 blocks of 8 floors each, uh, total of 23,864 tenements. Uh, the residents have a leadership structure as well. Each block has an elected president, um, secretary and a treasurer. The sites can be characterized as homogeneous in terms of the caste and class composition, with nearly all of them low-income households belonging to either the scheduled caste or scheduled, uh, <coughs> scheduled caste or uh, other backward classes communities. However, the site is heterogeneous in terms of the origin of the residents before resettlement. They come from multiple different localities, which has its own effect, as we shall see uh, further. So um, I've conducted. Uh, the, the study is still at a pre preliminary stage and so far I've conducted 15 semi-structured interviews uh, uh, of residents, auto drivers and the president of the Pan, uh, Perumbakam village panchayat and uh, the current ruling party's block secretary for uh, Perumbakam. Um, so I'll quickly get into the insights that I gained from the residents. All the residents unanimously agree that the party machinery was more approachable in the localities um, where they were evicted from. One resident, a lower level DMK functionary, in fact, uh, said that he was from a locality in the Saida Pet area where the DM, current party DMK had a very strong presence. And he reported that for every issue, they were able to reach out to influential members within the party to get problems resolved quickly, despite being uh, in an informal uh, housing situation. However, in Perumbakam, he was not even able to successfully establish ties with the community that resided in the site prior to the tenements, what he calls the old timers, who are associated with the ruling party. And uh, residents also said that the elections are much more relatable affair in their uh, earlier localities. Uh, party workers are much more responsible about residents casting their votes. Um, so naturally, the residents report that they have completely lost all interest in voting. Um, 
one of the residents who operates a uh, card selling biryani said that her family had always given up voting and that during the recent uh, assembly elections uh, her son had to convince her to um, go go out and vote and she said that with the finality that uh, she has completely lost interest in party politics uh, dis- despite being uh, closely associated with the party in her earlier locality so uh, another crucial issue that was raised by resident is the depoliticization of grievance redressal the slum board which is currently called the uh, tamil nadu urban habitat development board is the state department responsible for services at this di- site the people however felt that within the administrative boundaries of the chennai corporation uh, they had twin advantages of separate departments for metro water electricity etc where they could approach for specific issues and also having approachable party workers to help expedite the re- resolution of civic issues in perumbakkam on the other hand the resettlement colony these residents report that they did not see the point of going to any party worker and instead try approaching the uh, president of the panchayat who is in turn due to the administrative structure not empowered to help and the uh, uh, responsibility for the site lies with the uh, tamil nadu urban ha- habitat development board which is like uh, one uh, devel- one government department handling everything that has to do with the resettlement colony so this indicates the absence and circumvention of this uh, clientelistic party worker who carried out favors for resident in their earlier locality Marie, this process was a up? crucial can you wrap up yeah within one minute so uh, this process was a crucial component that determined their sense of place and identity in their earlier locality and which is uh, missing here um yeah i'll end with that Thank you, thank you, Nanesh. Uh, can we go back to Simpreet now? Simpreet, are you there? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So, uh, like I said, Simpreet is a PhD student at the Tata Institute of Social Science. Uh, so, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, like uh, Marina has uh, covered uh, the larger. Uh, uh background of the rnr colonies in uh, mumbai and uh, mostly at the level of the governance and uh, accountability uh, so uh, i will be uh, focusing on one of the uh, like a very specific sites uh, which was a result of the uh, world bank funded mumbai urban transport project uh, from 2000 year 2000 onwards like uh, more than 50000 families were shifted all across the city in different Uh, resettlement colonies and one of the colonies uh, the lubai uh, colony uh, it's on the eastern edge of the city part of the uh, m east uh, administrative uh, ward and uh, uh, i have focused on the uh, the the rebuilding of the lives by the uh, people once they uh, find uh, in a in a colony uh, people from different parts of the city uh and uh, just being as a result of an administrative uh, exercise they are like bundled together and uh, shifted in this colony and how the life it has been almost uh, 15 years uh, more than 15 years now that uh, they have been here uh and uh, a- a- as i've told uh, shared that uh, uh this is on the eastern edge of the city and it's just not like a historic it it, it follows the trajectory of the uh, of the the urban spatial expansion of uh, 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 mumbai uh, start which starts even from the pre colonial times and it uh, uh, under which that whatever is not desired in the in the core of the city is shifted on the periphery and thus the periphery also keeps on shifting so there is no one single periphery like in 50s the uh, sign was the uh, was the limits of the city and then uh, as the city expands this the periphery also uh, keeps on shifting and in case of mumbai it's just not mumbai city you have navi mumbai also you have uh, thana municipal corporation also which means that uh, uh, as uh, karenet said they like this per- peripherality is not about is just not geographical but there are many other aspects to it um, uh, so uh, lalubai compound uh, like if one goes back like uh, 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 like like 100 or 150 years back uh, like this on the left map one can see that it, it was part of a creek so there was no land and uh, as the city expanded uh, so even this land was uh, produced and uh, which produced like this uh, layout of around uh, 60 buildings uh, so some of the buildings are 
4 g plus 4 and some are uh, g plus uh, 7 and as um, rena has talked about like how transferable development rights were used to uh, create uh, such a uh, urban form and uh, so when these people uh, were shifted and uh, so there are around uh, 60 buildings so uh, so uh, i was part of a group which were working uh, in one of the buildings building number 21 sindhu cooperative uh, society uh, in the top photo uh, photograph you can see like this person is standing on a patch of a land it so happened that this building was on the uh, on the you know, one corner of the uh, the lubai compound and it shared a boundary with the slum so this long patch of land you know was earlier used as a garbage bin by the uh, residents of the uh, uh, building themselves as they uh, used to throw the uh, garbage from their windows of this patch and uh, uh, a few years back uh, uh, we came uh, together with the residents uh, of this building and it was decided that okay there will be uh, some other uses of this land or, or what can be these uh, possibilities Uh, so a group of artists and uh, architects and the uh, cooperative housing society of this building uh, so we uh, decided to use this land as a uh, to pr- try to convert this land into uh, like a garden a uh, garden space and a uh, part of that space as uh, on the left uh, uh, corner photograph you can see as a as a cultural space where uh, the residents can come together and uh, do different things and one of the thing is like these uh, book reading sessions uh, uh, by people who come outside and do with the uh, kids so the, uh, these uh, and also there have been like oh, as the time has uh, passed so there have been like different lives of this space uh, through the local corporator we were able to get these uh, julas and then the trees earlier it was barren and then Uh, some of the trees like these bamboo trees and other trees were g- uh, grown up and uh, uh, so in this uh, 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 process there have been like certain insights that uh, and this is uh, still ongoing uh, uh, i'm going to share some of the insights uh, very quickly so one is that we uh, all talk about r and r and uh, the the resettlement uh, is what i think the state also focuses and and somewhere uh, it just uh, stops at the first r the second r which is about the uh, rehabilitation which is much more longer process in many of the state interventions the rehabilitation component is totally absent uh, which was not the case so in uh, uh, mutp uh, mumbai case uh, because it's uh, the policy uh, still talked about in paper there were some rehabilitation aspect of it but in practice that has been totally absent so in a way whatever rehabilitation takes place or not takes place it's it's then uh, most of the Uh, people's initiative as they uh, build or they are able to build on their uh, lives uh, the state mostly absolves the uh, uh, itself in case of mumbai and in other experiences also that has been the uh, case so which i think needs to be reiterated uh, that if it is r and r it is just like the, if the rehabilitation is the most uh, 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 important aspect of it and state just can't build houses shift people and then uh, move out the, the second is like in case of lullu bai and maybe in other cases also like it, it also linked with the trajectory of deindustrialization uh, like this lullu bai uh, the land of lullu bai compound was only like a aluminum uh, factory uh, although it was not like a factory uh, it had a huge land piece of land but it was it it, uh, it, it didn't had like lots of workers uh, uh, somehow uh, but then uh, so the it has been deindustrialized and this land has been then for the use for the building up of the uh, r and r colony which means that so um, and which is the larger context of uh, mumbai the background the way the uh, trajectory of uh, mumbai where uh, the mill story is much known but then there are other sort of such uh, instances also where uh, this has happened because what it also does to the people Uh, those who are the present so occupants that can 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 talk we wrap up in the next 30 seconds yeah pass uh, talk uh, to their past they were somewhere workers and from workers their status shifts to uh, pap and they take two three more important aspects about the 
uh, like how do you build a community because they are from diverse backgrounds and uh, from different uh, language religion and uh, when they are coming together so a community is to be produced which doesn't so there is cooperative housing act which is supposed to build them but this uh, this doesn't happen in many of the instances there have been conflicts between the uh, uh, the people in the buildings and the slums uh, next to the building so that is there uh, so th it's a major challenge uh, which remains uh, and state is not uh, taking care about it and even people are uh, to an extent uh, engaging in that uh, but uh, also not uh, just last point is that yes this there's this um, security of tenure uh, which is there but also there are insecurities uh, insecurities that a build in which is about when people are coming in such r and r colonies they don't have any sort of a, like a community feeling or a, 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 the fellowship now which is being replaced by putting up of cctvs by the cooperative housing society so for me this like this virtual security which is the promise of that it points out that uh, uh, there is lack of trust uh, between neighbors between different buildings uh, uh, the, uh, between different people so uh, like how does one then further take it so there are like many examples but uh, uh, i won't be able to share because of the positive time and uh, sorry for uh, taking more time thanks thank you sampreet um and we go now to kinjal sampath and nidhi sohani to talk about um, delhi karun while we pull up the slides i'll just begin so um typically scholarship on resettlement sites and, and incremental housing in resettlement sites concentrates on this moment of dislocation uh which yes shapes how uh people build their houses but there is more to it we want to talk today about this idea of futurity in resettlement colonies like karen also spoke about initially um there is from being moved from slum settlements to resettlement colony there is this uh, sense of holding property which is endowed to residents uh, my co-panelist um, uh, kaveri also spoke about uh, a citizenship being becoming more robust through this granting of stronger de jure tenure security rights so um what we want to talk about is how do you factor in this idea of futurity which then starts shaping how residents look at housing in resettlement colonies because these ideas of uh, a stronger sense of citizenship also shape the way they materially consolidate their homes um our our findings are based on savda ghevra um a resettlement colony in uh, the peripheries of west delhi it's a large scale sites and services resettlement colony we undertook a study about a decade post its inception so when we went there it was already a matured resettlement site um i am going to run you through an example of okay can you please go back 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 to the second slide yeah i am going to show you an example of uh, g's house uh who moved to who was dislocated from um kailash colony to uh savda ghevra in 2006 built a small house as you can see this uh timeline of her construction built a small house then in 2010 she builds a 1 plus a g plus 1 story house in 2013 she sells this plot because she suffers a health shock in her family and builds a g plus 2 house making profit out of the out of selling the first house now she uses that that profit to sort of sail through the health shock and when we spoke to her in 2018 she has a g plus 2 house as you can see in the last last uh, illustration over here it's well constructed but she tells us that she's still keeping an eye out on the real estate rates because she's looking to move out of savda ghevra we call this approach even if it is materially consolidated the the approach to futurity over here is one of escaping so this is one of the ways in which we've unraveled how people look at 
maturity when they're consolidating their homes. We have two other ways in which uh, people do this, which I'll briefly talk you through. One is uh, reconciling, which is to say that they're still making sense of the conditions they were in when they were dislocated. So they're still making sense of the resettlement colony as a space to uh, maneuver the everyday functions. Uh, it still very much remains, in, they still very much remain in that space and they, their idea of futurity is sort of in a stasis, if I can say that. Uh, the second escaping, which I just talked to you about, where, peop, where the resident is primarily looking to move out of Savda Ghevra to make a life outside of Savda Ghevra. So they are waiting for an escape uh, while continuing to sort of manage living till they get an opportunity to do so. This again may take multiple forms. Geeta Ji we saw consolidated it to a great degree, but we have other examples where people don't consolidate their homes to that extent. Uh, they hold back the capital as uh, a way to sort of make that move later on. The final uh, category is investing, where residents view Savda as the place where they want to make their future. So this is where they um, invest not only materially, but also maybe in other ways, let's say in uh, finding livelihoods or a way of mobility in the uh, or a way of future mobility in Savda or around. An example of this would be um, one of our uh, respondents. Uh, their sons were also invested in, you know, uh, making a life in Savda Ghevra. So they ended up also setting or taking on rent at shops in Savda Ghevra to sort of do this. So what I mean to say by this is material consolidation might not be the only marker through which we can gauge the way in which residents are perceiving their future. Um, and it can also translate to ways in which it's, it's not just the house or the material conditions of the house, but also how they're viewing their intergenerational social mobility. Um, next slide, please. So what we want to talk over here basically is, why is this important? Why is this idea of futurity important to acknowledge when we look at incrementality? So as, as, as we've demonstrated to, a level, to an extent, it's not just what the house looks like that can be used as a marker to gauge what the future of the settlement or the resettlement colony will look like. It is also important to understand and factor in how people are sort of um, uh, imagining their lives beyond the moment of dislocation and the everyday. So uh, uh, this is not to say at all that futurity is the only way in which, uh, the only factor which defines how people are sort of um, uh, building their homes uh, or con consolidating. Uh, it very much def depends on other factors like their material conditions, their uh, um, life experiences, their resources they have. Uh, but it is nevertheless a very crucial thing to keep in mind when we study incrementality in resettlement colonies, because these, as and I'll circle back to the point that these are these are very different from where they've been relocated from in the sense that they have a more settledness in their uh, tenure security. So and that that shapes how our that shapes how we view our built in built environments and how we read them. Great. Thank you. Are you, you. Are you done? Okay. Excellent. I mean, we're trying to keep some time for uh, responses to questions, and I think there'll be another opportunity to. Um, but thank you. I mean, you've all done absolutely fantastic with time. Um, I would like to uh, now ask my two co-editors who will be, uh, you know, editing this volume with us. Who, uh, one of whom is online, Amita Bide, Professor Amita Bide from the Tata Sciences School of Urban Policy and Governance. Um, and uh, then after that, uh, Anand. Hi, Amita, please. Hi. Uh, thanks, and uh, 
accepting my online presence and sorry that I'm not there. Uh, so I'll just try to, uh, so Karen introduced this entire volume as a volume or, or a set of rather two volumes where we are trying to do justice to two processes. One is definitely, I think, the significance of what is at play is immensely illustrated and demonstrated by all the presentations that we saw. Because what is happening here is not just a few resettlement programs uh, which were scattered as Karen was demonstrating, but an entire phenomenon at play and where the entire dynamic of the housing and land market is currently being reworked uh, uh, by combining uh, these issues of uh, intent of inclusion, whether fractured inclusion or whatever, but one is combining these multiple objectives and therefore it is becoming a very significant phenomenon. So that's, I think, immensely demonstrated. I think the second thing that all these presentations bring home to us is how uh, some things are being reworked by the state uh, and at the same time, some things remain very much the same. So I think Kaveri's presentation around property rights or uh, Marina's presentation around accountability, though institutionally there are different forms which the entire resettlement machinery has taken, uh, there are several things which have not been worked out. So these are kind of incomplete transitions. The same incomplete transition is perhaps also seen in the way in which uh, uh, Naresh talked about the political implications and how uh, uh, there are newer challenges both to political parties as well as towards bureaucracies. Uh, but, and of, I think the uh, element of contesting all of this, which is very much in show and very much in play to the uh, Mizoram examples, I think both of them, the way they deal with even a, when presented with the reality, that resettlement is not their own instinct in some ways as like one saw in the case of Bangalore or Chennai or uh, Mumbai. But here, clearly centralized programs have driven an agenda uh, in ISOL and which then local governments and local institutions are contesting. So I think all of these transitions which are involved, which are highly muddled, are something which tell us about the significantly layered and complex uh, nature of transition and how Indian cities themselves are being remade. The second part, I think that the volumes are also trying to deal with is then, how are these uh, settlements also, and how are residents within these colonies also remaking lives? And I think that space is also immensely illustrated to us uh, by Kinjal Nidhi, as well as Simpreet, and partly also by Lalita and Simpreet's paper, maybe perhaps also Naresh's paper, and where each of these are these transitions towards citizenship, towards uh, creating a place which is habitable, uh, people are working against multiple uh, odds, I would say. The formality uh, and the structures of formality are definitely in place. So when Naresh talks about the depoliticization, I think there is a sense of bewilderment or when simply talks about the loss of community and yet trying to build that through the small interstitial spaces which are being created. I think these are ways in which people are trying to reshape and remake. Uh, but altogether, cumulatively, a picture which really speaks about crisscrossing, how different scales of Indian cities uh, through these bottom-up as well as perhaps top-down processes are really reshaping and remaking uh, Indian cities and a very, very major segment of uh, Indian cities which is now being reworked and uh, reformed in multiple ways. Thank you. I'll stop it. Thank you so much, Amita. Um, and you know, we hope you'll also engage more when the questions come up. That's great. 
Um, and uh, lastly, we'll have an intervention from uh, Anant Maringanti, who is the director of the Hyderabad Urban Lab and uh, the other co-editor of this volume. The, 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 the remaining 20, 25 minutes or so is actually for us to hear from everybody in the room. Uh, because we have already heard our papers amongst ourselves, we have read it several times, and we really wanted to get some feedback on how uh, people are hearing what we are saying. Yeah. So, sorry. yeah, there are several other papers in in, in the collection, um, and what we are trying to do uh, here um, uh, is to try and see if we can pull it all together into some kind of a conceptual framework and see whether it is making sense to people. Whether you hear uh, something that rings true in what we are saying. Yeah? So the starting point of this whole conversation is what Karen said right in the beginning, that there is some kind of a process going on in a Indian cities, particularly the metropolitan cities, where there is a belt, a zone that is emerging at the edge of the city. And that belt or zone or whatever you want to call it, is not fixed in time, it keeps extending. So for example, right now the city could be 300 square kilometers, it might become 350 this year. Three years down the line, it could become 375 and then it could become 500. So the urban periphery is actually not a fixed location, it keeps shifting. Right? So there is that shifting urban periphery and that's the space in which all kinds of very interesting things are going on. One of the things that, that we are noticing in that is there's a lot of resettlement happening. And that resettlement is really often about rehousing people who have been pulled out of the city. And two is to upscale housing that has been in a bad condition for a lot of people. That's a big story. That said, what we are seeing then is what Karen described as peripheralization, discrimination, and disconnection. And this is the the uh, lines that we are seeing, which is actually a pretty depressing story, right? So if we are seeing that the capital is doing something, state is doing something, different kinds of factors are pulling some kind of a project of development or redevelopment together, it seems to be uh, a, an overwhelmingly depressing story. Now, within that overwhelmingly depressing story, we've also heard a number of narratives which are about struggle for building some kind of accountability, which are about trying to build a small library, a play area, doing something creatively within that, trying to figure out how to critique the loss of political agency. Right? So there are different ways in which people are trying to build opportunities for themselves. They're being helped by other people and so on. That's the, the big, broad story urban territory, which is something shifting, there is something going on there, and there's something going on there, is both a story of uh, a depressingly uniform marginalization, but also one in which you see lots of little possibilities. And so on. that's one time that we're hearing. What I want to do is this, taking this big story, which actually sounds to me a little bit like a big structure or system story. Right? The moment we say marginalization, peripheralization, we're talking about big processes that are shaping something, which in their very descriptive character are disabling. Right? What do you, how do you then recover agency from within something which is peripheralizing you, depolitizing you? Right? And we are then telling stories of individual projects that somehow seem to be overcoming the, the, the systemic uh, operation. I think one of the ways in which we can think about this is to think in terms of pathways. The way it seems to me, actually what's going on in this periphery, urban periphery, is that parcels of land, which are marked by different kinds of historical processes. So you have urban commons, you have private lands, you have all kinds of pieces of land are being brought into the urban for particular types of accumulation projects for builders, for land sellers, so on and so forth, and to take care of. Right? So basically what you have then is a way in which 
pieces of land which have been thrown up by a variety of ecological, environmental, um, managerial, political processes are, are being brought into a new regime. And that, I think, is what we're actually finding very interesting and exciting. How is this actually happening? What is this way? Then that brings us to a bunch of very interesting processes, right? So when you have something like this happening, that 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 incorporation of the urban commons in the, the rural commons, the agrarian commons into the urban, obviously is going to bring some kind of an ecological fight. You're going to have floods. You're going to have a, a, a big uh, garbage dumps coming up there, landfills coming up there, and somebody needs to figure out how to manage all of this. So you see, a city like Hyderabad has a lot of these new small municipalities all around it. And those municipalities allow people enough room for experimenting with how to manage these, how to incorporate them into more stable structures, because right now it's a whole lot of fight going on, and then gradually bring it back into the larger big cities. Right now, it's too early to bring it into the big cities. So you have to municipalize it first, and then slowly bring it into the system. So there's one of that stuff going on. And, and, and then the second, I'm just going to quickly finish in two, two, three minutes. The um, second story of pathways is the story of how people are figuring out their social mobilities, right? And, and that story, which Karen actually initially hinted at, she said that these are largely scheduled caste people, Dalits, OBs, and those families, individuals, are trying to figure out, right, as, as, as Kinjal and Nidhi pointed, they are making calculations about what to invest in, how to invest, where do you put your money, how do you acquire, how do you make acquisitions, even with more. this stuff, what are those pathways for social mobility? Who wins, who loses, who gets thrown out of this whole project, and who succeeds, right? And there are stories where people actually see lots of people committing suicides, and we don't know how one person gets located in an extremely vulnerable position with respect to these pathways. That then gives you the third big question about pathways, which is the question of time horizon. Because regimes of accumulation, regimes of bringing about political and administrative and governance related stabilities, take time, not very long, but the time has to be shortened. You have to build the necessary institutions for that. But you're talking about something like 15, 20 years, not long. Right? So what is that time scale in which new institutions are being put together, new kinds of politics are coming together, and so on, which is precisely the reason why, for some time, you've got to make sure that people don't have any political agency. Because that's too disabled, right? So you have to make sure that they're going to be disabled so that you can quietly build the, the necessary stability. That uh, a, a question of of, of uh, um, um, time cycles is also a question of household extended richness. You, have, you get married, you have a child, the child takes about 15, 20 years to get to a point after being through school to get a job, to make money. Right? That's the, the struggle. For most households, they have to think in terms of what am I going to do within the next 10 years or 15 years. The futurity is actually that that how do I think about this house as part of my accumulation strategy at the household scale. So I'm saying that we need to think about the land and, and the pathways through which land parcels are brought into this regime. I'm saying that we need to think about pathways through which individuals and households figure out their own social mobility. And I'm saying that we need to think about the time horizons within which this happens. And that will allow us to tell a very, very nice story. This is my reading from all of these stories. Now it's open for everybody to respond. Just a very small query. Um, how would uh, how would the people who had been residing in those areas already responding to the resettlement colonies and look, um, just like like what is the response? My quick response to that actually is that we have already heard it, right? Every single person, every single unit is responding to it very, very differently. 
No, no, no. What about the people who already like, like there's a locality and people have been living there, and then this resettlement is happening. So, how do the inhabitants who had or like been living in that locality respond? Yeah, I hear what you're saying, and there are many sites that do involve uh, taking over a place that people are already living in and and the state building there. There's you typically a lot of conflict. Uh, those people are given some housing there or they are sort of pushed out further, uh, resettled further out. and So there are various ways in which this is done, and there are actually some articles written about it. Um, in Chennai, I'll just give you a thing, there's a, it's a, there's a tremendous amount of ongoing battles. One of the things none of the papers talked about today is the ongoing violence in these sites. Uh, you know, just battles and quarrels and you know, stabbings and all of that which happen on an ongoing basis. And part of the struggle is between prior residents of the site and the newcomers from the city. And so, you know, these are in that sense sites of ongoing violence. So that's just one quick response. I don't know if anyone else wants to respond to that. Yeah, and as an ecologist, like whatever comes to my mind is like, how would the non-human uh, creatures respond to it and also that, um, you know, there's this concept of memories of former ecologies and the ecologies that will be lost as a result of it. And, uh, you know, they would reside in the memories of those who were resettled very early. And so there will be interesting stories about those. So I think that uh, just to add on to what uh, Karen said, it will also depend on the kind of land parcel that is inculcated and the kind of city. So in a Bombay, in a Manhood, it would be, look very different. Uh, in a uh, erstwhile marshy land that was made into a land, it looks very different. And then in something like Saudagera, which was originally a village and it continues to be a village, it looks very different. So either there is that kind of very uh, uh, sort of contested, uh, uh, crowded uh, kind of an outcome. In Zavda, we see a complete sort of disjunction and <laughs> almost like a boundary. Ye colony wale log hai, ye wale log hai. And you do, absolutely do not do any economic transactions, even if there are opportunities, but you will do it with the city. And so there are those kinds of, I think there are multiple strategies of it. One is just uh, drawing up the boundaries so tight that they don't mingle ever. The other could be something like contesting over the same set of resources. Other, but that depends on every site will have a history of its own. So I think it will be difficult to capture here. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you. That was really a fantastic session and some uh, topics so close to my heart. So I was, you know, uh, really, really happy to see this emerging as such a sort of between different cities of the country. Uh, some of my quick thoughts may not be all really questions is example of Katputli colony, for instance as you know, a resettlement colony twice over now in the making, where it's been resettled once, and now it's been removed so that a developer can come and uh, get building development rights to give that resettled colony in from the 70s a, a sort of EWS tower in the larger. So that is one point. Uh, the second is the myth of marginality. Are these retail settlement colonies now over time, as you know, in Savda Gebra, et cetera, they are no longer really marginal spaces and they are not really uh, spaces of, so, uh, and this is where the whole problem of resettlement colonies also overlaps with the unauthorized colonies. So in the case of Delhi, for instance, it's hard to separate resettlement colonies, unauthorized colonies over time, because it's been happening for the last 50 years now. So I feel like, how do we, how would you be able to separate the two? And it come, kind of comes back to that question earlier, that these are very often made on rural peripheral lands, which are actually agricultural lands. So there, that contestation in many cases is not there because there is this urban village or it was, yeah. Sure, sure. 
So, I mean, I can just leave it at that because uh, I can continue my conversation with you later. But maybe the question would be about the Katputli colony and future development rights and the question of thinking of it as a, really, is it really marginal spaces only or is it just sort of lack of policy to create spaces of expansion and extension in cities? So, because in Delhi now, they no longer can convert any of these resettlement or unauthorized colonies into the municipal boundaries because of decades of uh, living, uh, people living there. So there's like this policy uh, fix there. Yeah. Uh, so I had a question, two questions actually for the panel uh, in general. So one was that I wanted to know more about uh, in terms of uh, the disconnection in livelihoods how does that uh, really play out? And uh, does it also uh, lead to coping mechanisms where there are uh, newer kinds of livelihoods that emerge in these areas, uh, which are also maybe peripheral, such as um, uh, resettlement colonies near a waste dumping ground? So um, uh, uh, that, and a related question also is that, um, in the wow. sense that uh, does uh, do these peripheral areas then form their own economies, which also yeah. lead to newer migrations, which don't go in the city center, but in these uh, peripheral areas, which no longer, in one sense, remain uh, peripheral. I have a question that follows on from that, really, which was to wonder about, you know, as Anand was saying, this big term of peripheralization and so on. And I mean, uh, it sounds very accurate in some way, but I was wondering about the changing spatial structure of the city as a whole. You know, so many other things are going on, not just resettlement. So new um, suburbs, new cities, new roads being built. The structure of the city perhaps might catch up with these places and they might become, in fact, close to new centralities. This is something that we see in some South African cities that, you know, settlements that are built seemingly far out of town actually become close to a new um, commercial area, for example. So. Sorry. Um, okay, but let me just uh, start with this entire center periphery thing, I think. One part of it is uh, it's not a dichotomous category. So you may become a part where people get absorbed in quote unquote center, center adjacent, whatever you want to call, but there are elements of peripherality, right? So let's say South Agavra, the site we studied, is right now in a legal limbo. So there's always, you are standing on a ground as of now, which is uh, not, uh, you know, sort of always shifting. So I think it might be more useful to think of elements of peripherality which exist. And, and over time, they may go up and down depending on the cycles that they are seeing. So for example, to just connect it to the Katputli example, from 70s to something, you have a more stabler sort of uh, time period. And then again, you go through uh, this. And, and the reason is your original peripherality element of it that actually puts you through cycles of it. So I think rather than a dichotomy between center periphery, maybe thinking of it as elements and uh, is perhaps useful and just on the Delhi thing, sorry. Just to that question, I mean, yes, the dynamics of the changing, uh, and now there's uh, uh, the uh, Delhi Metro Rail Station that has been built in the city And I love that question about uh, employment, because I think one of the other ways we wanted to cut our data was to look at. So if you think of those categories that Nadi presented, reconciling often is actually not being able to bring your 
occupation and your place of living together. So we had examples of people who would live part-time in the city where their original occupation lied and then the family would be relocated to these lands that Karen spoke about, which are 50 kilometers outside. There's a breakdown of the family structure. There is a complete different way of living, all of that. Uh, and again, in terms of investing, a lot of our cases, if I was to put that dimension and we didn't have the time, would be people who were able to marry their occupation into these new lands and were able to actually quickly get on that cycle of expanding. Uh, the other part of it is very uh, related to where they are located. So one of the booming sort of occupation, let's say in something like Gevra would be e-rickshaws because their distance from the nearest metro station or the nearest bus stop would be something. But it has changed so quickly because the bus stops and the metro stations have advanced much nearer to them. So now again, there'll be, so there are these episodic sort of things that they can do. And then there are overtime investments that people do in terms of, as Nadi said, buying shops, uh, putting up tent houses because uh, it's 10 years into it. There are young children who are now getting married. So one of the booming businesses there mm -hmm. is tent houses. So yes, but I would say the three categories that Nadi presented could also be looked at how are they able to reconcile uh, relationships of employment and housing? I just wanted to add uh, to the question on livelihood. I wanted to add something from the ISOL context. I think it also depends a lot on the you know the scale at which we are talking about. And I think in smaller cities, especially maybe also in especially when you have different kinds of topographies. So in a hilly uh, city like Aizol, um, even a short distance walking is quite a bit because you have to walk uphill and um, roads are very bad. So I think what we saw there in the resettlement sites, all of which are outside the existing settlement of the neighborhood, which is called Den there, um, what it meant is that it was like uh, it, finding new livelihoods became really, really difficult. A couple of sites were actually located next to a potential opportunity, like for example, a quarry. So then you had that kind of you know, uh, construction work. A couple of others, literally there was just a road. Uh, there was road construction ongoing. And so they would just you know, be, be very low skilled, you know, very hard labor. So I think the kind of opportunities people had were quite minimal. And it's a lot to do with, as I said, not just the topography, but the size. Because these are small places. So each BSUP site, maybe you know, you're looking at, say, 300 households, 400 households. So on their own, and this is a, a, a concentration of pretty poor people with very few kinds of, you know, the kind of capital that they have, different kinds of capital is limited. So I think where we saw some interesting explorations on transport. So for example, several of them, we saw many people investing and continuing their older jobs of auto rickshaw or taxi. But then again, that also is a little complicated because the, largely the people you're, tra you're carrying are people from your own colony who again have a limited amount that they can pay. So I think it's, it was, it's, it's, it's really, I mean, the ability to sort of break through this and really, an, you know, become a new commercial site, or I think is very, very difficult in a place like Aizol. And I would say there are a lot of smaller places where if you had resettlement housing happening on a bigger scale, would find it really impossible. So there's a question for Kaveri uh, online, which is, uh, uh, a clarification, the term permanent temporality, does it refer to temporal change over time or is it something to do with tenure, tenure security? Just a quick response to that. Uh, yes, I mean, the, the uh, my, my reference is in terms of definitely on tenure security. It's on tenure security, okay. Yeah, um, yeah. I may be a little all over the place because I'm still thinking about what all of you are trying to say. Um, so on one hand, I see that as in the three categories that you spoke of, which is peripheralization, disconnection, and discrimination. Um, is there also an aspect of um, desirability? And I'm here talking about how the state's, state is looking at these spaces. And when you're talking about the cycle, on one hand, there is, you know, like Atputli going through a certain kind of cycle where it's uh, completely expendable uh, for the state. On the other hand, it's also forget, uh, uh, forgotten by the state for like 30 years or so. So is there something happening in terms of where these spaces shift between 
uh, being expendable to being tolerable to also being desirable right so here um, in that case we're also looking at the way in which so when they are resettled and thrown at, to some uh, uh, peripheral space um and they are left to uh, left to fend for themselves in terms of building a community make make that place livable um there is also a sense of expropriation of labor um that's uh, uh that's coming in I, i don't know if i'm making sense but there's a way in which they're putting in a labor of a different kind which is not yeah. that of the workplace alone which also becomes a space for expropriation maybe 30 years later or maybe 20 years later yeah. so uh, i was thinking of this shift between being expendable to tolerable to then desirable yeah. definitely yes i mean would anybody else like to answer so just a quick it's, uh, it's actually a process that that in 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 some of my earlier work they refer to as cannibalization mm. because there are there are ways in which the 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 appropriation or expropriation of that labor is essentially cannibalization mm. Avery wants to say something. Yeah, I, just uh, I I think I put that in my comment as well that these spaces, at least the one that I studied, it's uh, it's a peripheral. It used to be a peripheral part of the city. It was in the city municipal corporation area, uh, but over time it became absorbed within the BBMP, you know, the metropolitan um, uh, part of the city. And uh, I I my ethnography over uh, six years. uh i looked at how that space you know initially began in the 1980s some of my interviews were completely far flung absolutely no services so there is a lot of labor and this labor is not necessarily just paid work or wage labor there's a lot of labor that is put in by the urban poor to develop these areas because once in these new spaces once again let alone they they need to create their own political networks to get access to services but getting access to services means that you they are essentially converting unserviced uninhabitable almost you know those kind of areas into inhabitable residential areas so there is a there is the labor of development uh, the development of these entire neighborhoods that is put in by by the poor who are resettled and i see that uh, frequently these areas that are so called peripheral once they become part of the city and become absorbed into the city then you need to find new spaces of uh, resettlement or uh, rehabilitation for the state it's a great strategy because they have uh, the urban poor developing areas which they otherwise do not have to put in uh, work into and once these areas are absorbed in and this is something that i look at in my book and i discuss in detail that these areas also become very very desirable areas you begin to have a lot of interest from urban poor from various parts of the cities to actually then obtain housing within these rehabilitation rehabilitation areas and colonies and then there is a competition between the urban poor for housing within those sites they are the older rehabilitated poor then the, the newer ones which are being rehabilitated there's a lot of conflict there's a lot of uh, struggle amongst them uh, to gain more land within that uh, rehabilitation area yes. so so yes. these are uh, you know precisely what uh, you know the comment was made right now these are they they transition they, they even the peripheral ferality is also temporary you know it it changes over a period of time especially in the context of larger cities thank you uh, kaveri so we have 5 minutes more exactly and what we're going to do is this uh, i think amita would like to say something more um and then um there are two questions here which we're just going to take and not answer um we'll take them for our edification and later sort of thinking about so uh, amita please uh, go ahead and then thanks kaveri uh so i think i wanted to respond to basically this thing of uh, transitioning peripheries and i agree with the overall comment made that peripheralization is a temporal uh, phenomenon and it can keep on shifting but this thing of cannibalization i think the new phenomenon that we are seeing is that the state also binds itself a bit uh, in this new resettlements that we are seeing because the built form is different 
there are also newer institutionalizations through the uh, kind of grant of property rights the formation of new associations like cooperative societies and these are much more difficult to uh, kind of get rid of or cannibalize over a period even if that only becomes and comes in the desirable category but what is also very possible is the kind of gentrifications that these areas may undergo over a period of time and i think uh, these are the things that perhaps we need to look at then especially in this book we are trying to look at not just resettlement because resettlement has been there in indian cities a very brutal forms that one has seen since many many years but i think there is something new which is happening and uh, i think we need to pay very close attention to the different layers which are happening within these transition thank you amita and please to lorraine um yeah um well this is a very broad kind of a a comment or question but you know is there any i mean one of the most surprising things about this kind of this trend that you're describing um which has actually been playing out over a long period is that um you know that you're going to to place um people of similar you know socioeconomic uh conditions all together in mass housing and and not anticipate that this is a social problems will arise or you know this whole question of social mixity um that is such a big issue like say um in Europe for instance where any kind of social housing has to be planned with other you know medium income housing or higher income housing this kind of this kind of thing is there anywhere in the discussions among policy makers and planners um just to push back on this idea that there's this mass housing of you know low low income people very often on the on the far you know peripheries of 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 cities um that this is a social problem this is i mean it's just it's just kind of surprising that there isn't more a discussion about this yeah uh thank you all very much for that um i just wanted to uh, leave a I'll, i'll turn it into a uh, a suggestion comment or a question which is i think the to connect this to jenny's talk on yesterday on methods of theorizing because <clears throat> i think one of the things that is really interesting to me is to see how the different chapters or cases or sites will talk to each other right and i think the question here now then becomes not just the question of a comparative gesture like jenny was talking about yesterday but i think the possibility here is to really think about methodologically what this form of a joint volume um how it relates the whole and the parts and i think anant when you were talking about the idea of the regime and these pathways but i th- i would just i think i would love to see from this collection of really important work to think about what it says about the urban beyond resettlement and i think there's something precise about saying that resettlement seems to hold labor form politics and social hierarchy in a very particular way but specializes and i think that then the question becomes that you and you use the word regime and i think one way we're always debating in you know say political economy what era are we in right it's this neoliberal this and the conjunct this idea and the question is methodologically how do you define a historical conjuncture where some spatial political economic realities become stable for a while right this is our regime and i think that there's a possibility here from what i'm hearing that resettlement is a site in which a historical conjuncture can be identified this is the political economy of the indian urban at this point and resettlement allows you to bind that conjuncture to say a certain set of logics have become slightly stable i think it's a really important site to do it and then it allows us to say something about land labor capital and citizenship not just practices communities and places because i think a lot of what happens about resettlement i have struggled with this with all of you is we end up writing about the places but not from the places and they become actual places and not types of places and types of social economic configuration so just an urge to think about and to offer also back in the book a method of writing across sites that's not patterning or comparison but that is actually a multi-sided theorizing 
um, that is interested in saying that now this concept, this moment, and that theorizes a historical conjuncture more than any other form of housing. And because I think we have a lot to say beyond housing. And that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Those were uh, very useful comments. For I mean, this is exactly where we're moving forward with this book and trying to figure out how, we, how it all fits in together. And every time we think about it, there's more. And every time we think about it, there are new angles. So I think, um, you know, we, and what you heard today was a sample of the papers. We had uh, many more, which are also really giving extremely sharp and, and interesting sort of overarching definitions to the phenomena, which we didn't have on here today. Um, and, uh, you know, so thanks very much for your uh, engagement with this. And we hope that maybe halfway through, we'll have another opportunity to present the sort of volume that's shaping up to you people somewhere. So. <laughs> That's a while.